to the class. Okay, just so you know that we are recording so we can put this on our YouTube channel. So after all of that, welcome everyone. I am Melissa Josefiak. I'm the director of Essex Historical Society. Um, we're very pleased to welcome you all this afternoon to the second of our three sessions about the Falls River flood of 1982, rescue, recovery, and remembrance. This afternoon, we're going to be talking about um, the recovery. Um, well, we have time for questions at the end, and we also have kind of a fourth presentation that we want to bring you that we just learned about within the last couple of days. That will be after the recording, and you're welcome to stay on uh, if you so choose. Um, on behalf of Essex Historical Society, I'd like to thank our presenting partners, Ivoryton Library and Essex Land Trust. Uh, we'd like to thank the planning team of Ivoryton Library's head librarian, Elizabeth Alvord, and EHS board member, Stacia Libby, as well as Doug Sen from the Essex Volunteer Fire Department. We have a great team of our EHS collections volunteers for their work on the, the slideshow. The show holds over 100 photographs from Ivoryton Library and also Centerbrook Architects. And our friend Danny Atkinson, one of our volunteers, also provided research support for the opening talk. I'd also like to thank our Follow the Falls team. Um, this is a long-term collaboration between Essex Historical Society and Essex Land Trust, um, in which we trace the historical and the natural significance of the Falls River. Um, and just as a friendly reminder, if you're just um, clicking on, um, our previous talk from two weeks ago is now up on our YouTube channel, which you can access through our website at www.essexhistory. Dot org. That's right on our front page. You click through the YouTube link and then you can search for our video. We'd also like to let you know that we will conclude this series on Sunday, April 10th at 3 p.m. for an in-person event at Trinity Lutheran Church in Centerbrook entitled Remembrance. When members of the public can share their stories, and that's open to all, uh, we heartily thank Trinity Lutheran Church for live streaming that event. We'd also like you to mark your calendars for June 4th and 5th as Essex Land Trust hosts a Falls River flood hike at the Mill Race Preserve in Ivoryton. And many area historical societies will be pre presenting flood rate related events because it certainly just wasn't the town of Essex. It was all throughout Middlesex County um, in which it was affected by the flood of 1982. Um, and as we talk about uh, recovery and resilience today, uh, no event occurs in a vacuum. Uh, those of you who know me know that I am Ukrainian. Um, and as we talk about uh, people recovering from the flood, I just want to gently remind you of the situation that's going on in Ukraine right now. And just as um, Ivoryton and Centerbrook and the towns of Middlesex County received support um, during this disaster, um, if it's in your heart to um, help the people in this global event right now, certainly uh, they would appreciate your support. There are a number of um, worthy humanitarian aid um, contacts through places like CNN or local uh, um, TV stations that can provide you with uh, good sources to support those people um, overseas. This is, this is everyone's fight that we're in right now. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of context um, because we have a lot of people um, that lived through the flood, but many of the people here are from <laughs> elsewhere or um, have moved to the area and the flood receives kind of the treatment almost of a myth over the last 40 years. What happened? These great stories can be shared. So I'd like to, to walk through a few of the slides to get some context before we um, uh, work through our speakers. Let's see here. So when we think about Essex's village, we, oh, sorry about that, one more time. When we look at the villages of Essex, Ivory Chin in brown, Centerbrook in green, I think I have to do this manually. Let's see, let me just shrink for a minute. I appreciate your flexibility. There we go. So when we look at the three villages, Ivoryton in brown, Centerbrook in green, and um, Essex in purple, you see how, as you can see my mouse tracing through, that the Falls River connects all three of these villages. And it's three villages, two rivers, and one shared history. 
Uh, now, the, the complexion of the Falls River has changed over time. Um, there have been a number of um, dams that were built on the Falls River going back to the 1690s to harness the water power um, that a small, swift moving stream uh, can produce. So all of these numbers represent the different dams that were on the Falls River. When we think of Ivoryton, five, six, and seven, five is the bull dam across from, um, excuse me, from um, the Copper Beach Inn. Six is where a molar instruments today is today. And then seven was farther up. It was across from the upper shop or what we call today the Pratt Reed factory. But even off the screen, higher up was another dam. And that um, provided uh, additional water power. Today is the Bushy Hill Lake, uh, part of Incarnation Camp. And when we think about all of these, uh, these dams that are supplying the water power to power the small industries that were here, including grist mills and saw mills and fulling mills, which is for textiles, and of course the ivory industry, that was very helpful in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. When you fast forward to the end of the 19th century, we have additional forms of uh, powering the machinery and water power takes um, a back seat. So going into the 20th century, many of those dams were falling into disrepair and they did not necessarily receive the care that they needed. Um, and so when you had a significant deluge like we had on June 5th and 6th of 1982, that put an incredible, incredible amount of pressure on the dams so that um, some people have said it was nine inches that fell in a 24 hour period. Some people said up to 18 inches in a three day period. And the pressure on that dam um, at the Bushy Hill Lake started to create incredible pressure and then it finally was breached. And we use a phrase, phrase not casually, but saying millions of gallons of water then hurtled down the Falls River and um, bringing debris and changing the course of the river temporarily. There were ponds that were built up behind those dams and that water was all evacuated. They went through all seven of the dams that were on the Falls River and its tributaries. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So much like a series of dominoes, you saw the water coming through. Thanks to our first responders, they could monitor the dams, know the trouble that was um, in its path and then get through, evacuate the people, make sure everything was, um, people were getting to safety. And it was truly a testament to our first rep responders that no one perished in the flood of 1982. Um, so leading up to that breach, um, all night people monitored the immense pressure being put on the Bushy Hole Dam, alerting first responders that residents in harm's way would need to be evacuated. It started in earnest the evening of Saturday, June 5th. Just before 1230 on June 6th, 1982 at Bushy Hill Reservoir, the Bushy Hill Reservoir gave way, the dam there did, sending millions of gallons of water hurtling down the Falls River, destroying dams, houses, businesses, personal property, roads and power lines as it traveled with incredible force. The water picked up stacks of lumber behind the former Pratt Reed factory and smashed it into low-lying bridges, creating new dams, artificial dams, and altering the course <laughs> of the water. Conservative estimates placed the cost of damages that night in Middlesex County at $277 million, and that's in 1982 funds. So the talk today, after we talk about what happened that night, but as the sun rose on Sunday, June 7th, and people surveyed the landscape, what would be the first thing that you, if you were there, and many of you were, what would be the first thing that you would do? The first phone call that you would make? What would you do on day one, on week two, on month six? How do you prioritize? Today, we're going to hear stories of recovery and resilience from three people who built sectors of the town or their organizations as they're building back. So when we look at the last two images to say, this was Clark's Pond, Clark's Reservoir, right across from the Bushy Hill Dam. This was the, the high water mark. And after the flood of 82, it looked like this. 
and you can see the water tower in the background for your uh, for your point of reference. So we'll be seeing now that the, literally the damage is done, what happens then? So I'm gonna check in with one of my co-hosts. Um, Stacia, do we have any good news? Yes, Bruce is on the line. Bruce, can you hear us? I can hear you. Fantastic, okay, great. I'd like to in introduce uh, town selectman, Bruce Gloack, who will talk us through the town response. Thank you for your patience, Bruce, as we work through those technical issues. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. I'm sorry that uh, I couldn't get on uh, on Zoom, but at least we've got audio. Yeah, thank so you. I appreciate the opportunity to go through um, what we went through in the flood. Um, it was quite a while ago, but it was a very memorable experience. And uh, what I'd like to do is just quickly go through um, some of the personal experiences I had, and then review wow. some kind of some of the rebuilding efforts that we had. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. All right, I, um, I'll just start with that night um, or that weekend when we were having torrential rains and everybody in the area just thought that, oh boy, it is raining cats and dogs out there. Um, my wife and I were living in Deep River at the time, but on the Saturday night when everything started to happen, uh, we were at um, my in-law's house, which was Merritt Nan Comstock on Ingham Hill Road. Um, we were having dinner and listening to the pouring rain outside and thinking, boy, this is really coming down. Um, but when we left to go home to Deep River, we went down Ingham Hill, and as soon as we got to the little uh, river crossing where, where um, Mud River went under Ingham Hill, it was a raging torrent of uh, whitewater rapids, so deep that I didn't think a car would go through it, which was very unusual because I had never seen that. My wife, who grew up on Ingham Hill, had never seen it either. So we went back to Taffy's parents' house, and um, there was a back way out back to 153 at that time. Um, through Farm Lane, what's Farm Lane today, at that time there was no houses there because those were hay fields and that was a back driveway that went out to the main road. So we took off and went down the main road and as soon as we got to where Tiffany Brook went underneath the road, um, 153, at the bottom of Mayor's Hill, we hit the same thing. There was water coursing across the road and we said, wow, this is really too much to behold, but it wasn't deep enough that I thought we couldn't get through it. So we we snuck through it and kept on going. Then we went through Centerbrook and tried to go home through Old Deep River Road. And we got down to you know where Falls River crosses there and that was totally inundated. The bridge was underwater at that period of time and it was like obvious that we weren't gonna get through. So now we were starting to panic a little bit because we had young children at home and we were thinking, boy, we're not gonna get out of town. And this is an event that we had never experienced in our life and uh, there could be some consequences to this. So we took off and we said, well, maybe we can get through Warsaw Street, um, you know, go out through Iverton. So we headed that way. But again, we were stopped. We got as far as Copper Beach and the little river that comes down adjacent to Copper Beach had turned into a raging <coughs> river and was filling the, the, uh, the road there, totally impassable. So we had, I knew that we probably couldn't get across the river in uh, where uh, North Main Street and Book Hill, that was going to be obviously flooded if uh, if the other roads were flooded on Falls River. So we had one last resort, and that was to get on Route 9, um, which we did, and we were able to get back to Deep River. It was it was quite a time, and as we, we once, once we got home, I had a scanner at home, and throughout the night I listened to, you know, emergency calls of flooding and damages that were being done. I didn't hear anything about Essex because I had a Deep River scanner, but um, Deep River was experiencing kind of the same kind of problems with massive flooding going on. So when we got up the next day, uh, we decided that we would go and see what the damage was in town and there was substantial damage in town. So we went down towards the firehouse in Elm Street, that was all flooded, which is not that abnormal for when we had spring floods. But then we looked at bridges in town, such as uh, I think it was Spring Street and Village Street, um, bridges that had been there for many, many, many years had been washed out and uh, there was limited access to many areas in the town. At the time, I was a, I had a landscaping company and a property management company. And one of my clients was River's Edge Condominiums in Iverton. And as I looked at the damage in Deep River, I said, boy, this is substantial damage. I think I better get down into Iverton to see what's going on there and see what's going on with uh, River's Edge Condominiums. So we got in the truck and we headed towards um, Iverton traveled down Warsaw Street, 
as I came into the town of Iverton, it was one of those moments that you have, you know, one of the, what the, it was just kind of surreal. It was the first time that I put meaning to the word surreal because I was looking at things, but my brain was not computing. As I drove down into the center of town, I looked behind the Iverton store and there behind the Iverton store, the lumber from Pratt Reed was piled up probably 20 or 30 feet high on top of the Ivy Street bridges and behind the store. And it was one of those things where your brain just kind of doesn't really understand what that is at first. And then when I realized that, oh my God, that's all raw lumber. That usually the Pratt Reed company had about a million board feet in their lumber yard behind the building. And this had all washed down. I said, what on earth could ever make that much lumber come down into town? Then I took a left to go towards River's Edge condominiums. And as I started to go down Main Street, the, the damage and the, uh, the catastrophic um, you know, event that had happened started to become relevant and, and, and I could see what was going on. There was stuff strewn all over the road. It was, um, it was difficult to get through. Um, but as I kept going down to get towards River's Edge condominiums, the first thing I saw, or the first real damage I saw was across from River's Edge in a small little ranch house there, um, my sister's in-laws lived. They were Catherine and Ed Wynn. They had a ranch and two-car garage adjacent to Falls River and kind of next to the bridge there where Falls River goes under the bridge. The bridge was gone, totally washed out. And I looked over at the house, the garage was gone, totally wiped out, nothing left of it, not even a sign of it, just some tools and other things scattered across the road, some lumber stuck in trees. And the house, I looked at the house, and again, one of those surreal moments, the house had been picked up, moved off its foundation, and pushed towards Main Street, kind of a little bit of a jog, and behind it was this huge foundation, which was now a swimming pool. And again, it was a surreal moment that was just... Oh my God, I just can't believe this. The winds had been removed from the house the night before um, because they, they knew that there was probably gonna be some flooding. So they went to my sister's house in Old Saybrook. And I called my sister on the phone and I said that uh, I said that we have a problem up here in Iverton. And she said, oh my God, what happened? Did the, did the house get wet? You know, <laughs> most people thought that the damage would be you know, a flooded basement and new furnace, whatnot. And I said, well, they said it's a little more than that. The garage is gone and the house is sticking out in Main Street. <laughs> she, she was a moment of silence. He said, here, talk to Gary, my brother-in-law. So that was an issue that we, we had to deal with. Then I went across the street to look at River's Edge and we could not get in there. As I said, the bridge was totally washed out, but so was the driveway to River's Edge. There was a cavern of, of mud and rocks and water um, going through the middle of the driveway and it was totally inaccessible. So um, it was an issue that I said, well, we're going to have to solve that pretty quickly because we've got 40 some residents that are trapped on the other side of that with no way in, no way out, and no emergency access for emergency vehicles. Um, again, more and more of the damage and what was going on started to become more evident. It started to sink in as to what we were looking at. So then I said, well, I'm going to, and by that time I had heard that the dam had broken in Bushy Hill and that was what was caused, you know, had caused this catastrophic, you know, more than just spring flooding damage that we were seeing in the town. So I drove up to uh, where Clark's Pond was up by Pratt Reed, worked my way up through. This was early in the morning. So, and where Clark's Pond one looked, where Clark's Pond was, it looked like a, a mini Grand Canyon. Just absolutely amazing. Pond, the dam was totally gone. If you looked up towards where Bushy Hill was, it was just a swath of trees and everything that was carved into the landscape. If you look downstream from where the dam from Clark's Pond was, there were houses that were tipped on its side, some houses that were washed away, cars tipped over and flipped over. It was just, it was something that you, you would see on the news, but you would never have, would think would happen to you or would happen in your community. Pratt Reed was inundated, obviously. The water came through and went through the whole factory, took all that lumber out and washed it downtown. The mud and rocks and everything strewn all over the place. It was just, it looked like it was a war scene. It really was just un simply unbelievable. Then we said, okay, everybody started looking at what was going on and saying, okay, what do we do? Where do we begin? How do we start with this? We started, uh, my job obviously was I needed to do something for River's Edge. So I said, let's find my equipment. <laughs> the irony of this whole thing was that the equipment, one of the pieces of equipment that I needed for recovery or to work was a Kubota tractor with a front loader that I had that I had uh, went the weekend to Eric Bosnack, 
who lives on Main Street in Iverton, just across the street and down a little ways from the Wynn's house. So we said, oh boy, what? wonder what happened to that. We went into his backyard where he had left the tractor, and sure enough, there it was, but it was buried in mud, sand, and silt up to the steering wheel. Typically, in uh, New England, get-her-done fashion, we said, well, we've got to do something. So I assembled my crew, and we dug it out by hand, shoveled all the mud and dirt around it, drained the fluids, changed the filters, filled it up with fuel, fired the tractor up, and drove it away. I, I always said it would have been a great ad for Kubota tractor because uh, I used that tractor for another decade, and it was still running when I, when I sold it. So it was really kind of amazing. We took the tractor, and that day we created a temporary road with using the silt and the sand and the mud and everything that was all over the place and all of the roads uh, to build a temporary road into River's Edge. Um, it wasn't pretty, but it worked. Um, and we could get we could get vehicles in there. And from, when we finally got into River's Edge to see what the damage was, we had found that uh, on the river side where the, there's four buildings there, the flood had come down. The flood had come down in a huge wave. It was almost like a big flush of a giant toilet came down and it blew the doors off the back of the buildings on the lower lower level, the basement level, flooded all the basements, and then literally just whoosh, flushed back out again. Um, so all this, the, the catastrophe happened in a short period of time, but it was in the next day we were seeing the aftermath, but it was, uh, uh, while there was a great deal of damage there because most of the people had finished basements, there was no structural damage to the building. So we said, okay, we will survive. Um, we can, we can move on. So that was, that was uh, the case of River's Edge. From there, we looked at some of the other places and, you know, just continued to see the disaster and we started to get into the recovery period. Right after the flood, like the next day, the governor who had declared a disaster of the area called up the National Guard. And the National Guard came into town to prevent looting, um, which I didn't really see an awful lot of looting, but there was stuff strewn all over the place that belonged to people that, uh, that people could just pick up. I do know that uh, a lot of my friends got an awful lot of golf clubs because uh, Sounders <laughs> Golf Manufacturing was up in... Uh, Pratt Reed and all those golf clubs had walked down and just littered the stream bed all the way down. I, I think they found them as far down as, uh, as uh, um, uh, North Main Street. So a lot of people got a lot of nice golf clubs. But the National Guard set up checkpoints on either side of the town and they wouldn't let people in basically unless you were a contractor or a homeowner, try to keep the gawkers out of town. Um, again, another surreal moment to see National Guard trucks uh, cruising around town um, they brought in water, they brought in blankets, they brought in cots. Um, they, they did whatever they could to kind of alleviate uh, some of the things that were going on in town. Um, following the National Guard, oh, they, yeah, they brought big water trucks in, I did say that. Following the National Guard, um, they, oh no, the National Guard also did an emergency bridge up by Pratt Reed, where um, Arks Pond was, where that big cavern was that I said. They created a emergency bridge across there so we could get access to Pond Meadow Road and to Bushy Hill, um, open up that end of town. Um, some of the bridges were spared, obviously. It was amazing that the bridge to Walnut Street and the Ivory Street bridges were actually intact. They didn't wash out, and it was simply because the water cascaded right over top of them. By the, you know, moved the lumber and stuff and actually protected those bridges, and it just cascaded over top of those bridges. Um, but by the time it got to the bridge on uh, Main Street in Centerbrook by River's Edge there, that one did wash out totally. Water service was interrupted because water mains were broken. Um, telephone poles were put down. I mean, it was, it was a disaster that we had never, ever seen before. The recovery period was just as amazing as the disaster that we were looking at. It was really great to see the community come together and everybody you know, pitch in and try and get things done. As I said, first thing that happened was the National Guard moved in. That was followed by Red Cross came in. Um, then FEMA came in once the area was declared a disaster area. Uh, and multiple things started to happen to try and put people's lives back together. The first thing was emergency housing. Um, we had people who had literally lost their homes, had no place to stay. Um, they were temporarily put up in hotels or uh, stayed with relatives. Um, but longer term housing had to be found. Um, Dick Riggio was a was the first selectman of town, and he was instrumental in organizing um, the rescue efforts or the temporary housing efforts. We from the state we had we got a number of portable houses like trailers um, 
that I think were used for the tornado that had hit up in Enfield. But anyway, they came into town and they were set up in the big parking lot by the railroad tracks, um, which would now be between, be between the new apartments and the railroad tracks. Um, a number of them, I can remember, is probably 12 or 15, but they were for the people that had, were going to have long-term recovery whose houses were literally destroyed. Um, likewise, uh, the, the Small Business Administration, like I said, FEMA, started to come in with loans and grants, low-interest loans and grants. And then the, uh, um, the Soil Conservation Service, SCS, rolled into town to start recovery efforts, physical recovery efforts um, on the stream bed itself. Um, they came into town with huge equipment, giant excavators and giant loaders with wheels that were, you know, eight feet high, um, looked a little out of place in poor little Iverton, but nevertheless, they could move a lot of uh, debris in a very short time, and they began the restoration effort. Um, I, ch I chuckled at the time because it was, I was beginning to get involved in local politics at the time, and we all know how difficult it is to uh, deal with wetlands sometimes. Um, actually, this was emphasized when uh, we just built that Walnut Street Bridge a couple of years ago. We had to do all sorts of studies and jump through all sorts of hoops um, just to make sure we protected the, the salamanders and the, the bottom scour and anadromous fish and anything that could be associated with a stream. And here, after this disaster, we had giant excavators and loaders running up and down the stream bed itself, scooping and dumping and, you know, reestablishing the, the flow of the stream and the, the channel of the stream and putting tons and tons of riprap rip, rip on the edge, um, coming in with hydro seeders and hydro seeding the banks and the rocks and everything happened in pretty short order. It was, it was an amazing, amazing feat. Um, and things were put back into place and uh, it began to, it began to look like more like it used to um, before the flood. It was, uh, as I said, it was an amazing time. It was, it was amazing to see what kind of work could be accomplished under those emergency orders, really kind of gave them carte blanche um, and money didn't seem to be an issue. So um, work just happened. It went on gradually and gradu more, more gradually, the community started to feel like its old self again. Things got put back together. People learned to live with detours around bridges that got washed out and uh, wait for the, the long-term recovery for them to get put back in. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was different, but it was, a, it was the community pitched together and really kind of got through it. It was a, a trying time for everybody, um, but I do have to say that we got through it with flying colors. It was uh, it was proof positive that us old Yankees, when we put our mind to it and uh, and push, pitch in together, we can achieve uh, and get through obstacles that we would think uh, would be impossible to get through. So it was um, it was different. I laugh now because it uh, at the time, or now I find myself coming to meetings in town and uh, and being the uh, the old codger in town that uh, remembers when people started saying something and I say, no, that's not the way it was. And they said, how do you know? And I say, well, it's because I was there. Well, I was there during that flood and lived through it. And it is something that I will never forget. Thank you. End of my story. <laughs> no, Bruce, that was amazing. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, that was a really great encapsulation, um, especially about um, the next day about how do you start? Um, that's exactly what we needed to to um, begin this presentation. So thank you. I'm really glad that we that we worked through the audio. Um, if possible, if you could hang on to the end of the program, uh, we might have some facilitated questions for you. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, pivot to and now talk to uh, former Ivoryton head librarian um, Lorraine Donovan. Lorraine, can you hear me? I can. Oh, fantastic. Now the uh, Ivoryton Library was almost um, right in the path of uh, the Falls River <laughs> itself. So you had an awful lot of rebuilding to do. If you could share the stories um, from the library, please. Mm -hmm. I'll be happy to. Here's another old codger who remembers the flood. Um, the night of the flood, uh, my husband and I had been at Essex Junction Theater. Yes, we had a theater over there. There was a movie theater. And very much like Bruce, when we tried to come home, we could not get down Main Street in Ivoryton, right where near River's Edges. And since we live up on Chestnut Street behind the Playhouse, 
and our kids were home, we're like, well, we've got to get home. So we managed to double exactly. around through, <laughs> through Deep River and took Kelsey Hill Road and came down Warsaw Street to oh, Highland God. Terrace. So, so that worked out. We went to bed thinking it was just mm -hmm. a whole lot of rain. And the next, probably a few hours later, there was our doorbell rang and it was my daughter's friend and her parents who lived on Main Street in Iverton, who had been told by the fire department they had to evacuate. So in they came and um, her parents went down to the firehouse because they were housing evacuees on the second floor of the firehouse that night. So I got up the next morning and our house was fine. We're on a hill. And just a quick aside, since our house had burned down in 1980, if we were flooded in 82, that would have been really unfair. So I blissfully walked down the hill thinking a flood is just a lot of water that goes through and then everything is fine. My absolute most indelible memory is the stench of gasoline because it had gone through the Iverton service station at that time had gas, so gas, and it had ripped through the gas tanks and the smell of gas was nauseating. So then I knew, I looked around and like Bruce said, the wood and cars and just filth, sheer filth. I went to the library and I opened the door and the first floor was fine. The water had filled the basement right up to the tippy top step and then receded. So we were very, very lucky in that sense because in, in 82, the downstairs was not really utilized for anything more than a meeting room or maybe story group, story time and, that, and crafts and to store our books that were going to be cataloged and um, used in the book sale. And it was unbelievable. I went down, there were chairs, like wooden chairs hanging from the pipes on the top of the ceiling, the exposed pipes. So the water had risen right to the ceiling in the basement. And there was just debris and books everywhere and anything that was down there was not where it had been initially. So it was a little overwhelming to think how we could even begin to clean it up. But, and once again, as Bruce said, you know, the volunteers and people who came in to clean and put things back as they were, one of the big concerns was mildew because books, and moisture do not live very well together. So we had <laughs> on the front lawn and the tables, we had these books standing upright and fanned open so that they could get dried out and maybe we could salvage them. The other memory I have is people came to the library a lot of people came into the library, not so much to take out books, but just to be with people, just to see something was somewhat normal in town because the upstairs looked pretty much like it always had. And the impact and the shock that some, you know, something like this could happen to our little village and the whole area. People could not, they would start a sentence and then they would just drift off somewhere. Concentration had gone out the window. So people were just 
couldn't get their heads around things. Slowly, obviously, that changed. But the mood of the villagers was just, they were dazed and shocked. So it was, I like to think at that time, just having the library, which was kind of control central for like the National Guard were in and out of there. And there were a lot of, you know, it was a pivotal area. But at, at the same time, some of the photos. it's like anything else like this. You see the resilience, you see the determination. And we also had every kid in town, I believe, had a full set of um, golf club heads. They scat. There were kids everywhere scavenging for club heads for what for no good reason. My son had like four in his room for years. It was just a memory, a memento almost. But it was watching watching the National Guard and that it was so odd. It was almost like being under martial law in the way, having soldiers march not marching, but around all the time. And the, the water, as Bruce mentioned, we had to get, you know, tote our water. But, it, and we had a curfew, I remember. We could not come back into town and I don't remember what the hour was, but they were very, they isolated the, our village, especially because of concerns about looting and also vulnerability, I think, at that time. So it was it was a pretty, it, hopefully a once in a lifetime experience, like so many experiences like that. Very negative, but also very positive. So um, I hope we never go through it again. But it is certainly a huge part of Iverton's collective memory. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. This is Melissa. I have a question for you. Um, and that is, when did you see operations going back to normal? Oh, I'd say months. It seemed like months before we really, It what I think, and this was 40 years ago, Melissa, so I could be wrong. I believe the National Guard stayed there for a month. It was it was quite a long time before, you know, I think they felt that we could hang in on our own. But I, I'd say a good month before it seemed like people had come to grips with this. They were kind of getting back in sync with life, except for those people who of course did lose their homes and were working with FEMA and um, which was not easy. It was very com complicated. So for most of us, I'd say a month or two months, but for a lot of people, I'm sure, it was a good six months to a year. I had heard that the roads were blocked for close to a year, that it was a challenge to get back into Ivoryton for many months. I don't remember it being that long, okay. but but um, there were bridges out. So you just kind of learned to, um, you know, head in different directions. But fortunately we had alternatives, mm -hmm. but you're right now that I, I I don't, you know what, I was so insulated in the library between going home and going to the library. That was my focus. So I'm not as clear on, Bruce probably has a better recollection of that than I do. But um, yeah, it, it, it was a major disruption. I mean, obviously a huge disruption to which people adapted. Sure, sure. And that's part of the resiliency too, you know, and when as I had launched the talk by talking about 
the mythology, you know, your experience and Bruce's experience could be completely different from what other people were um, had experienced as well. So getting kind of a cross section is very helpful to understand the, the full picture and then recording it, because um, then we could put together the pieces of the mosaic to tell the, the full story uh, of the yes. experience. So, so the same thing, Lorraine, I'm going to ask you to stay on in case we have questions at the end or if they're in the chat. Um, and now I'm going to actually switch gears and um, go into a different, let me see, just uh, hang with me for a bit here, uh, PowerPoint presentation. We have Mark Simon, who is a principal at Centerbrook Architects. We'll be talking about Ivoryton, um, but I want to introduce Mark and have him talk about the Centerbrook experience. We heard, uh, actually, because some people sent me email, we saw in the chat, I said, why are you always talking about Ivoryton? Because certainly the Falls River goes through all three of Essex's villages. So I'd like to, um, to introduce Mark and he has a unique uh, perspective about Centerbrook. So uh, please take it away, Mark. Thank you, can you hear me? Perfectly, thank you. Okay, here's some pictures of the, what we, what we discovered. Um, Here's an aerial shot of our complex and what was left of the dam. Um, the whole, the, the, the rain on Saturday and Saturday night was insidious. There was no wind. It just kept raining. And I live in Brantford uh, and it rained hard in Brantford, but not nearly as hard and as long as it did in Ivoryton and and Centerbrook. Um, the evening before Saturday night, um, I looked out my window, uh, we were having dinner and we noticed that water was streaming down our neighbor's driveway and just wasn't stopping. It was starting to really get thick. Um, you know, normally in a rainstorm, you see an inch here and an inch there. Well, suddenly it was covering the whole, uh, the whole driveway. But it still didn't seem uh, that dangerous. Uh, the next day, in fact, I went and played tennis in Guilford indoors. And um, I was playing with one of my partners and he said, I just got a phone call from, uh, I can't remember who it was, but so-and-so. And he says that it's really terrible up at the office. So um, that struck me. And as soon as I was finished hitting the ball, I rushed home, grabbed my wife and we started driving out. And like Bruce and Lorraine were saying, it was hard to get anywhere by that time. And this was, um, I'd say maybe 10 or 11 in the morning. It was hard to get to, uh, to Centerbrook. Um, and uh, we finally got there and our dam has a fall of 11 feet. Um, you're seeing, by the way, pictures here of construction over the years since, since the, uh, the, the flood. Um, but when we got there, um, all you saw of the dam was about a two foot to three foot drop in the water. The, there was essentially a huge lake behind our office. Um, the wood from Pratt Reed had come down and gotten blocked up in the forest below our office and created a gigantic lake. Uh, but of course there was still the, the force of the water and we had a number of old shed buildings um, and one of them uh, there's a picture of one right there uh, that had been taken down before, but there were several others. And here you see a cut through the back of the dam. Uh, the water was high enough so that it went around the back of the dam. Um, actually, let's stay on this picture. This is yeah. really good. Um, the dam is to our left. There was a grassy slope between the end of that jagged pile of rocks and the building and the water eroded that grassy bank away and created a whole new channel here. And to your right, you see an underground stone wall. Our factory ran on water power and inside the factory 
had been a large cast iron turbine that ran um, all the equipment by direct drive. Well, that stone wall, that tube, which is called the head race, because that's where the water came into the turbine, um, uh, really saved our building. Um, you can see that it was starting to get eroded at the corner there. Um, but the head race saved our building. Uh, one of the younger guys in our office was all set to chainsaw off the back third of our building because he was convinced it was going to fall into the water. Thank God he didn't. Um, but uh, this was all, when I got there, the water was, um, well, if you look to the right here, the water was up to the bottom of that green paint on the edge of the building there, right there. And everything to the left was underwater, more or less. Uh, it was just this gigantic lake. Now, if you see in the far, at the far point, um, yeah, right there, you see sort of the shreds of a building and uh, the bit of a roof sort of arcing over. That was the old forge building, or that was the remains of the old forge building. Most of that forge building just disappeared. And we had a tenant in that forge building. It was a one story long structure like a barn. And we had a tenant, John Furness, who was a woodworker. And he had a lot of very large equipment, saws and so on, industrial grade saws, which were very heavy. And then he had made for himself illegally in the loft and the trusses underneath the roof, a sleeping room, I guess a, a bedroom of sorts. Um, that whole building just got demolished. And what was amazing is that most of the roof floated intact as a truss that, with the truss structure down about a mile downstream. And when he went, he found most of his, his uh, bed and other uh, things still inside, inside the, it was kind of like a Noah's Ark that it landed. The big heavy equipment just fell, flopped over sideways into the waters. So he was able to recover that, but the building was really gone. And um, as were, I think seven other uh, smaller outbuildings and sheds. You can see the remains of one in the background. Um, so it was a lot of really, uh, it was just, a, it was just terrible destruction, terrible destruction. We had no septic system because that had been washed away. Our septic system had been out back um, under a parking lot um, and so talking about recovery, we didn't get that all rebuilt for at least six months, uh, maybe more. First, we had to rebuild the dam. And uh, that's a little story I'll get into in a second. But um, yeah, you can see the parking lot there on the right. Um, this is after some of the reconstruction with the riprap along the side of the of the, of the stream bed. Um, but we couldn't rebuild until we had um, the dam rebuilt. The dam, uh, not too long afterwards, there was a town vote, a, a vote in, at, at uh, I think at a town meeting that said that the town would help us reconstruct the dam and they would help with the funds. This is looking at location, this is looking at the back of the dam, by the way, uh, with the water heading around it to the right uh, after the flood. Um, and that passed handily, but then for some reason, somebody in town felt that the town should not be paying for this because it was helping private property. The argument was that it would help town taxes to be have lakeside homes rather than a streamside home or mudside home, uh, but that didn't, uh, if you stop on that slide, this is a very good 
picture that shows you um, where the water went. The dam is to the left. It's that big L structure. And, um, but the water went to the right and around it and created a new, carved a new route. Um, you can also see that it started to erode under the toe of the dam. Uh, you can see there's sort of a, a ditch right there. Uh, when water goes over the concrete like that, um, uh, and there's enough of it, it erodes at the foot of the dam. So that uh, also needed to be repaired. And what we did was we filled in between the end of the L and uh, our building with uh, stacked blocks. And I think we have some pictures of those coming up in a minute. But in any case, um, the town decided for better or worse that it should not, that there was a new vote. Um, and not many people showed up because they were convinced that like the first vote, which was practically unanimous, everybody would agree to rebuilding the dam. It got voted down. And rather than organizing a third vote, we said to heck with it, we'll just try and raise money. And uh, because certainly our neighbors upstream want to see their lake back. And it took a little while, but um, we rebuilt. And this is, by the way, uh, the building we rebuilt on the footprint of the old forge building. And um, this is at the base of the dam. We have a lot of riprap underneath this grass um, to protect it. But uh, we actually ended up uh, getting a really nice spot down there uh, that you can see is used uh, for uh, very fierce athletic performance. Um, so uh, here we are rebuilding. And um, this may have been, oh, at least six months after the flood. Uh, you can see it's still summer. Uh, so I'm guessing it's like September or something. Um, maybe that's not six months, that's three months. But um, we rebuilt the dam as fast as we could with these uh, concrete blocks that get filled with soil and rock to make them stable. Um, and that allowed us to reshape uh, the grade around the dam and the bottom of the dam and our and our parking lot and allowed us to put in a septic system. We were blessed by having wonderful neighbors. The bank next door let us use their bathrooms for uh, almost six months. Um, since then, in recent years, well, here's this is when we rebuilt the, uh, the shed, we put it up on piers, concrete piers. And as you may all know, the the flood of 82 was a 500 year flood. That is to say that uh, the experts assume that you'll have a flood of that depth every 500 years. Um, but we were told that we needed to design for 100 year floods, which would be more common. That is to say five times more common because once every 100 years rather than 500 years. And lo and behold, not too long after we built this, we had a hundred year flood and here it is. And our building is safe because it's up on these concrete piers and the water just flowed underneath it. Next. Um, this is uh, the aftermath looking at uh, the area behind uh, the Darlington house, our neighbor during the flood, next. I'm not sure when this was taken, but- uh, I've got a note here in the margin of 2010, Mark. Okay, so this is the, this is the flood of 2010. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was deemed a hundred year flood. Okay. And uh, I hope you can, you're welcome to say next slide, please. I know we had talked okay. about scrolling, but I'm happy to do it manually as well. Yeah, okay. Um, so here we are with a hundred year flood and you can see that uh, we needed to put those buildings up high to protect them. Mm -hmm. Next. Mm -hmm. Next. Um, since the dam has been reconstructed, we've done a number of interesting things 
there. The first is that we've put these loops of coiled pipe uh, and into the pond behind us. And we use the pond for heating and cooling. It's a geothermal system, essentially, that doesn't have to go into the earth. It goes into the pond. The, uh, the state, uh, we, we needed to get permission from the state to put these in the pond uh, for environmental reasons. But the uh, because it's a flowing stream, uh, the heating and cooling that comes from these pipes uh, is really minimal compared to what the sun does in a single day. So the state deemed this to be just fine for us to use the, the pond as a geothermal source for uh, heat in the winter and cooling in the summer. And it's been a very, very efficient way of heating and cooling uh, our new building that's on the old, the site of the old, uh, of the building that was washed away. Next. Um, this is putting those pipes in. And what you do is then you, you run um, a potable grade liquid through there. Uh, so if, in case there was any leak, you're not going to poison anything. Um, but you take the, the, you take essentially water and you run it through those tubes and then you take it back to heat pumps and um, they collect either heat or cool depending on the season. Uh, and it's a very, very, as I say, a very efficient system. Next. Here they are about to be sunk into the pond. Next. Um, another story after the flood, um, Bill Grover, my partner who unfortunately passed away this past year, uh, who is standing here on the upper right hand corner, lived in a very large house in Iverton. And uh, miraculously, the waters came up and entered his front door by a quarter inch and then stopped. But that meant that his basement got flooded. And he had just collected from his father-in-law's estate tons of equipment and saws and what have you. Anyhow, needless to say, the basement got flooded and it got filled with mud, the consistency of yogurt. So you couldn't pump it out and you couldn't shovel it out. It was this sort of in-between state and it had to be bucketed out. And here are the members of our firm who spent a day bucketing out his basement. Uh, and as they bucketed, they found occasional lumps of something in the muck. And that was all taken out to his lawn and then hosed off uh, to find uh, you know, old saws and tools and what have you. But it was quite an undertaking. And um, Lorraine was talking about the stench of gasoline. Well, the mud in his basement smelled half like gasoline and half like sewage. It was really horrific. But um, these guys heroically uh, spent the day and got everything out of there. And um, he was able to reuse his, his basement uh, not too long afterwards. Another story about Bill is that during the night of the flood, he and his wife Dee heard some screams outside um, and looked out their front door. And there was a party of people clinging to a stone post across the driveway from their house. And the driveway had turned into a river. And they were saying, we're going to drown, we're going to drown, save us, save us. So Bill ran back into the house with Dee to find rope. Of course, they decided that he was abandoning them and they were screaming, you're going to, we're going to die, murder, murder. But he found enough rope he found enough rope upstairs. Remember, he was flooded down to the basement, but he found enough rope upstairs to tie together to throw a rope across the river and pull each of them to safety, after which they decided he was a hero. But uh, um, that was the kind of thing that was going on that night. Uh, nobody, it was all dark. Nobody knew what was going on. And um, I'm sure there were many other heroics that took place, uh, saving people from drowning. Next. This is uh, our office 
looking across the pond and the dam not too long ago, but uh, not before, uh, this is before we put in a fish ladder. And in the past year or two, uh, well, two years ago, we put in a fish ladder and we'll see pictures of that. Um, the pond uh, has had a dam at the, uh, or the, the river has had a dam at this location for over 300 years. And for those 300 years, certain kinds of fish like alewife uh, could not get upstream to spawn. And there's been a major push to try and uh, reconnect alewives with their, their uh, traditional spawning areas. And um, so uh, the several dams below us have had fish ladders put in and um, we've put one in now. And we are literally uh, today, this spring, counting the number of alewives that are coming upstream through our fish ladder with an astonishing little electronic device. Next, let's see if there's some pictures of it. Um, of course, when we got the, the pond back, we were able to ice skate on it, as well as just look at its uh, beautiful waters. Next. Next. Here is the uh, new fish ladder. And uh, this was a ceremony celebrating its uh, completion and uh, it runs uh, during the spring months from March through maybe June. And the public, you are all invited to come see it. If you go to our lower parking lot, you can go across that little bridge we saw a little while ago and go and um, look at what's going on. We have a window, uh, there's an elbow, you can see the concrete on the left, there's a little window there. And if you're lucky, you'll see the fish resting before they start their next climb up the ladder. We're getting alewives and a variety of other fish as well. So it's all very exciting. Next. Here it is in winter. Next. The uh, the astonishing thing to me is that alewives find their way upstream by their sense of smell. And uh, they, at the foot of this fish ladder, there's that little concrete box with a narrow tube at the end of it that jets the water out. And uh, not down at the bottom, yeah, right there. And somehow that helps them smell their way up, <laughs> up the ladder. Uh, and uh, so they make their way up the ladder uh, and uh, are able to spawn upstream. Next. And none of this would have been possible if, if our neighbors, friends and neighbors from up the stream hadn't helped us uh, rebuild the, uh, and refinance the, the dam because um, uh, it was, much too much for our pocketbooks. We couldn't have done it ourselves. We had to do it with friends and neighbors. And um, we, we got a small business uh, loan from, from Washington uh, that helped us rebuild that to a degree and our buildings as well. At the time, uh, we thought it was just a spectacular uh, rate, uh, a borrowing rate. Uh, you may not remember, but borrowing rates were very high at the time. We got an 8% loan and that was considered spectacular. Nowadays, that would be about a 0% loan. Next. One day before the flood, one day before the flood, this had been installed. Uh, in the basement of our sub-basement of our factory. This is a low head hydro turbine. It makes power from the water going over the dam and through that head race that I showed you that's made out of stone. We had taken out the old cast iron one, which was a direct drive, which had an axle and belts coming off of it to, to run different machinery. This makes electricity and uh, the turbine uh, spins around like a rabbit, I mean, like a squirrel cage fan uh, and then turns that 
uh, generator that you see at the top, uh, which makes power. And uh, we are hooked up to the regular grid. Uh, if the power in the grid goes out, um, this has an automatic, all these red arms uh, are held open by the power. And if the power in the grid goes off, they shut down and stop the water from going through and we sort of instantly stop making power so that we're not sending power into the power lines uh, and shocking um, somebody working on them. But this has been working since 1982. It had been put in and installed the day before the 4th of June. And then the dam was blown out. The flood happened, the dam was blown out, and this didn't operate for another year. Um, and then we got it going, and it has been operating steadily since 1983, I guess it is. Next. We have to clean out the, the water that goes into it. Um, this is our old caretaker Milton scraping uh, leaves out of the, from clogging up the, the tube. Next. This is a picture of um, a young woman who worked in our office, Laura Taglianetti, um, who decided uh, to make fun of the hundred year flood and um, got her picture taken down here. Um, getting a suntan by the flood. Next. Uh, this is um, preparation for building the fish ladder uh, where we dammed off a section of the top of the dam uh, so that we can construct the fish ladder. Next. And here's the fish ladder under construction. And you'll notice that we used riprap on all sides of the of the uh, fish ladder and I'm glad we did because we've had some pretty big floods since then and uh, it's withstood those uh, with ease. Next. Next. These are some sketches for the fish ladder. Next. This is uh, not too long after we reconstructed the dam. You can see the new dam on the left where the truck is. Uh, and we refinished the old dam uh, to reinforce the spillway. On the right, you can see the new concrete at the top. And then you can see that we put riprap at the base of the foot of the uh, old dam, yeah, right in there. Uh, so that it wouldn't erode the way it did during the flood, uh, which almost undercut it. The uh, bulldozers that came through, Bruce was talking about large equipment. The bulldozers that came through were enormous. They're called D5s. And um, the Army Corps of Engineers, when they came through, they did an amazing amount of work in a very short order with this just gigantic equipment. Next. Here we are rebuilding uh, the old forge building up on Peloti so that it was up out of the foot, out of harm's way on the posts. Next. This is when we were starting to rebuild the dam. These are the first steps of rebuilding the dam. Uh, we had a large hole in the wall there uh, that happened during the flood that so that got that down below so that that got all rebuilt. The old stone foundations of the factory. Next. Okay. Here's the, oh, new dam. the new dam, next. This is what the dam looked like, uh, what was left of it after the flood. Just, yeah. It had been pretty tattered, next. Here's the turbine with water running through it. You can see what happens inside it. Next. And I think that's the end of the show, unless I go back Good. to the beginning, Mark. Well, that I've probably talked much too long. Um, but in any case, um, 
we wouldn't have recovered without the help of our neighbors, I can assure you. And um, uh, we are still to this day grateful and um, uh, try to give back by being good neighbors. And uh, again, you are all welcome to come and see the fish ladder. And um, if you ever want to talk about our geothermal system or anything like that, we're happy to talk to you about it. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. It's, it's so interesting to see all the different photos too that we don't have in our collection. So we appreciate the narration as, as we go along. Um, folks, I want to know if there are any uh, questions for Mark and Lorraine and Bruce. Um, perhaps Stacia or Elizabeth, can you monitor the chat for us, please, to see if there's anything in the chat? Or if there's someone who has a question for them, you're welcome to unmute. And identify yourself. Getting a lot of nice thank yous in the chat. I have a question. Sorry, this is Carol Harper. I put it in the chat, but I might as well say it. Thank you. Um, this is for Bruce. I was wondering, since he was the property manager at River's Edge and he built a temporary road, did anybody have to be evacuated um, or did the temporary road work well enough um, for a while afterwards? Because, because I live in River's Edge, we have no other means of egress. And I always wondered what people, since there are 40 units here, what people did to get in and out. If Bruce actually, is still there. <laughs> yeah, Bruce actually had to beg off. He had another engagement. So even though it shows that he's still on, he's not here. So unfortunately he can't answer that right now. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. You know what, Carol, I can just save that in the chat and email it to him and get an answer to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. You can give my phone number if you want. Oh, I can thank you. There. There's a question in the chat from Verena Harfst. Um, before the 1982 flood, the Falls River had eight dams. How many dams are there today? And would the new dams withhold a similar rainfall that Essex experienced back then? I know not all the dams were rebuilt. Not all the dams were rebuilt. Um, and I can tell you that the state now has a much, much stricter review of the dams than it did before this flood. Um, before the flood, we had been inspected by the state and we were of the eight, eight dams, we were the only ones that had taken initial steps to follow instructions. Um, we had designed repairs to our dam, but they never took place because the flood <laughs> happened before they, we got to them. Um, but since then, um, we have had to have dam engineers come in and uh, evaluate the condition of our dam and to recommend any repairs uh, on, an, uh, I think it's every other year basis. I can add to that about the Bushy Hill Dam, which of course is the one that caused the most damage, I think. Um, I worked with the engineer who was in charge of the rebuild for that. And um, I remember him calling me and saying that they had done a, a geological study of the area where the dam was to go back in. And he had bad news because the geologist said it would be good for only 3,000 years. <laughs> There you go. So I believe there are six dams left. I, yeah, the two in Ivoryton, the one at Clark Pond, it was not rebuilt. The one that washed right across um, into Cheney Street, washed across West Main Street into Cheney Street, that was not rebuilt. And then further down, it used to be Ivory Lake, and now it's this little stream along, um, sort of across from the Ivoryton Inn. There was a dam there that was not rebuilt. George Washburn's dam was washed away and I know he did rebuild that one. And let me see, there, were, uh, there was another question. Um, Marcy Fuller asked, were there any fatalities due to this disaster? There were none in the town of Essex, although in Middlesex County, I believe there were two, possibly three. There were a number of people that went missing for several days and that, that were recovered. Um, and I think there are a couple of people gone closer to uh, New Haven that also perished, mm -hmm. but not, none in the town of Essex. 
No, our first responders the night before when they saw that, and they weren't really thinking about the dam exploding and <laughs> the way it seemed to do. They were just worried about rivers overflowing, you know, and roads getting flooded. And so they were evacuating people in the low level. So we can thank them because houses were destroyed. Houses were lifted off foundations, as you say, and some were destroyed. So, but no, thanks to our first responders, no one in Essex lost their life. Yeah, after looking at those photos, sometimes some of them look like the lunar landscape. It was really a testament that everyone got out alive, at least in the town. I'm seeing in the chat that there are a couple of people that had noted in other parts, like uh, Steve Gephardt just made the comment about, oh, someone lost their life in Hadlime. Um, right. And I believe there's one or two people in Clinton that also died. Mm -hmm. What else do we have? I think that's all the questions. That's it for questions, Stacia? I think so, in the chat anyways. Okay. And folks, if you do have any follow-up questions, you're welcome to email me uh, through our website, essexhistory.org, and we can get um, answers for you. Um, I'm going to actually uh, encourage people, I know your video is off, but if we can thank Bruce and Lorraine and Mark for a wonderful presentation, either in the chat um, or through your clapping hands. We do, I'm gonna end the recording. If people are interested, we have a follow-up presentation that came to us through Carol Johnston at Incarnation Camp. Um, she did a PowerPoint slide uh, slideshow of what happened um, right after the dam broke and how the camp dealt with um, the rebuilding for a couple of years. So I'm happy to share that, but I will end the recording. Folks, you're welcome to stay on. Um, or I know there are, it's a busy afternoon as well. So uh, thank you very much for coming out. We appreciate that. Um, our next program to tie it all together when we will meet with the public will be on April 10th, also at three o'clock. And that will be held at Trinity Lutheran Church and will be um, a pass the mark, uh, mic uh, format. And so you can all share your stories if you so choose. That will also be recorded. So thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you to all of you. And um, feel free to stay on and I'm gonna walk um, you through that, that PowerPoint slideshow of incarnation. Thank you all. Thank you.